Okay, it is my great pleasure to introduce Chris Clark. He is a man of um, um, many, many, <laughs> many <laughs> possibilities. Uh. Yeah. Um, and we're going to hear more about the real possibilities tonight. But he's an environmental planner and a lawyer by training. Um, he was a founding member of Thelma's Board of Health. He worked for the 300 Committee, and he was a member of the, um, oh, and he co-authored co Thelma's first set of wetlands regulations, which goes, that goes way back. What, what year was that? Do you remember? It was 30 years ago, <laughs> mid-80s. Mid yeah. those, those have been revised one or two times yeah. since then, but, but he, he gets a lot of credit for having, having done that originally. Um, his professional work, <laughs> excuse me, is particularly relevant to Falmouth Water Stewards and our efforts. Um, his work, work has included groundwater management planning, environmental analysis, I just got over a cold, sorry folks. Oh my gosh. And regulatory work, including the permitting of coastal townwide sewer systems. Sound familiar? Anyway, so he is very knowledgeable and um, he's been a real asset to our board and he's going to continue to be an even bigger asset, I believe. Um, <laughs> in California, where he spends too much of his time, he teaches city planning during part of the year at Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. He is, was a member of the board and president of Morro Bay National Estuary Program and active with the San Luis Obispo County Land Conservancy. Um, he and his wife have, have a house in North Falmouth, and we are so pleased that they decided to spend more time in Falmouth again after many years away. So I am going to turn this over to Chris because he's going to introduce you wonderful things. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you all very much for coming out and hearing this. I have a handout which I'm going to get started around the room so that you all have something to look at other than me. This is from our website um, that talks a little bit about the uh, Water Watchers program. So as Sherry, thank you, mentioned, the talk tonight is about our Water Watchers program and it's um, dovetailing into the notions of citizen science and what that means and what it means especially here on Cape Cod. And I, I say that um, because as Sherry mentioned, I'm from California, I grew up there and was a more recent transplant to the Cape. So I've learned some about this area and want to contribute some more to it as well. So one of the, of course, interesting things, and this is the wrong audience to try to educate about this, is that Cape Cod is an ephemeral spit of land that's going to have on Earth one of the shortest lifespans. That is a pretty depressing thought, but it is true. I come from a geography that's uh, still, I can still see stuff from 25 million years ago, and that's not the case here. But we are going to see dramatic changes uh, in our lifetimes. And those of you who've been here for a long time have witnessed these changes already. And so the idea of having more people paying attention to our waters and our coastline uh, and making observations about this is going to be important um, from a standpoint of acquiring data. So. Here's a reminder, we were formed by glaciers and it just always boggles my mind that there might have been a mile or two of ice above us at one point. It was a pretty wild time with that water shooting out and dragging in boulders the size of buses and stuff, um, but it's calmed down. <laughs> and so we can relax for a little while, but then things will start to heat up again. Um, There's a 1921 map that shows these lobes um, of the glaciers. And I, I just love seeing this stuff. It's great fun. This is the coastline um, about 21,000 years ago. 
and you can see that it went quite a ways out. This is um, Shaw's work, 12,000 years before present. There's George's bank out there. There's a lot of land mass, and you can see it shrinking over time to eventually get to where we are now. And there's something that happens with us that we, whatever era we're born into, we assume that that's it. That's what we're going to have, and that's what's going to go forward um, forever and ever. My parents were born in the Depression, and so they still think that there's not going to be any money around. Um, one of them is still around. But uh, so this is the kind of thing that we are conscious of uh, as residents here. Now, 30 years ago, I was in Rhode Island, I think Warren, Rhode Island. I was giving one of my first presentations professionally as a consultant. And I was speaking to the group about groundwater protection, and I mentioned a little bit about geology. Afterwards, my boss pulled me aside and said, Chris, that was really great. You've really come up to speed on stuff, but I just got to tell you, the Ice Age was, you know, about 20,000 years ago, not 20 million years ago. <laughs> and so I stood corrected. Um, <laughs> And I've gotten much better since then. So, but it's all zero, so I don't know what it all means. So what do we do as citizen scientists? These are monitors. These are folks who are going to um, come out and work with us. Um, and not just us, but everywhere. Uh, water temperature, air temperature, um, the clarity of the water. And this important word here, I'll speak a fair amount about that phenology which is the changes that occur the first time we see things, when the bud opens, when the bird shows up, when the ice first hits the pond. These are the seasonal changes, and these are things that scientists have been studying quite a bit as the climate has changed, because that's the indicator of the physical processes in the world. And then other things. We can look at uh, this as part of what Water Watchers likes to do, is to report problems that we have with storm drains, uh, piles of trash uh, here and other problems with our water systems. But this is all part of what we want to see people do. And all that entails gathering data. Data is a plural word if you're speaking Latin. It's a singular in modern English, but we won't go into that too deep. <laughs> because agenda is also a plural word, but no one ever uses that correctly. Um, if you study science, and I don't know if any of you in here have, but it's um, rigorous and the processes have been tested for years and years. And one of the challenges of citizen science work is making sure that the work that's done has accuracy, follows procedures and things like that, so that this data uh, becomes useful. Every scientist will tell you that uh, gathering data is very expensive. My work, again, was mostly in groundwater, and our data comes from wells. And so when you want a point of data, you have to drill a well. And it might cost ten dollars or $15,000 to get a data point. So that's, um, that's extraordinary. But we all work on grants from different organizations or raise money through private um, funding. And so an opportunity to have a lot of people participate in science and gather data um, is a great thing and can save a lot of money. Um, data is subject to interpretation, of course, and citizen scientists can come with a bias for this work. They can have outcome bias, they can um, expect certain things to occur, and when they get an anomalous result, they may say, dismiss it and say, well, that can't be right. And so it doesn't go on the data sheet. Well, it turns out that even top scientists do this. Right, Chris? It's possible <laughs> that uh, we have, and psychologists have documented this, these biases that every, uh, everyone has. So these are, these are some of the challenges that we have to um, work with. Occasionally data gets hoarded. Um, somebody wants to gather it and keep it. And it. We don't share it enough, and so that's part of the problem. Um, but most importantly, as it says up here, is that this is the foundation of what we do, uh, what scientists um, need in order to achieve the results that are important for their work. Does it really help? 
Spatiotemporal variation and avian migration phenology. That's what my PhD, well, no. Um, <laughs> I don't actually fully understand this. Birds. But I understand this, citizen science reveals the effects of climate change and bird counts and uh, with citizens working on this is one of the oldest forms of citizen science. It's over 100 years old uh, that we've had people out um, in the field doing this work. And fairly recently, 2015, the Office of Science and Technology Policy published this fact sheet, empowering students and others through citizen science and crowdsourcing. A lot of this work has really been ramped up in the last 10 years. And the White House at that time um, really wanted to reinforce the work that was going on. And that fact sheet, I have a copy of it in the back, is very helpful in identifying organizations, many of whom have, again, been created in the last decade, that are helping organizations like us, us gather this information together. Uh, and deal with it. And I'll just tell you that one of the challenges that we have um, in doing this work is we can muster help from folks to get out and do things, but then what do we do with that information? It's oftentimes piled up somewhere waiting for someone to enter it into a computer. Well, we're working on methods to reduce that transaction cost by getting these other organizations involved. And I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, I'm going to chat about some of the programs uh, that I'm aware of, a couple that we're involved in here. I was out at the National Seashore last week and I talked to the headquarters about their uh, monitoring programs and their citizen science. They do a great job. Um, they, I, this is just a reading test for people in the back of the room. Um, but this was just an ad in their website for volunteers to do work, again in phenology, uh, to predict future trajectory of changes to seasonal dynamics in ponds and physical and biological features, similar stuff that we're looking for. Understand how climate change is altering physical features of ponds. Skills required. No technical scientific experience is needed, although volunteers must be able to walk short distance, no more than a quarter mile long. This is, the idea here is that um, these folks have scientific staff, they're organized, and they know what they're doing with the information. And that's what we're working on as well, is figuring out the programs that we want to have uh, this information be developed for. Okay, so that's the Cape Cod National Seashore. Let me push you out to California. This is where I'm from. Um, my house is back way up in that corner there. This is Morro Bay. And Morro Bay, that's Morro Rock, a very prominent feature on the west coast. And the bay is one of the very few remaining estuaries on the west coast. Um, we have more estuaries on the Cape here than the entire west coast of uh, the United States. I just made that up as a fact, but you know, <laughs> it's, it sounds better than 20 million years for the Ice Age. So, and this is actually where the 20 million years came from. This is a, a set of nine sisters, they call them. These are plutonic plugs, or volcanic magna, magma plugs, that uh, have been there for 27 million years. Um, and actually, this plug is um, about a quarter mile below where the top of the volcano was. So the ground surface was much higher than this. So there's been dramatic change since that time. But this is a very old geography, if you will. Um, it's a stunning place. And because it was not torn apart, uh, or filled or reclaimed for development, uh, it has become a focus of attention. And a group of citizens and scientists got together in the uh, late 80s, early 90s to get this nominated into the National Estuary Program. They were denied initially. It was too small, they thought, um, and there hadn't been enough background research done. So they ramped it up. They actually got the governor, Pete Wilson, to sign a bill that would allow this to come into the, the state. It became the first state estuary of importance. And then the estuary program, the national estuary program said, okay, 
come on in. Well, I think it's still the smallest estuary program uh, of the 23 or 27 that are out there. It has, uh, because it's part of that program, that federal program, they get around $300,000 a year funding, which is about what we get. Um, is that right? No, there again, I keep those, those zeros are just a mess for me. Um, that allows them to have a staff of about seven people and a nice office and a lot of equipment. And they have a very robust uh, monitoring program, volunteer monitoring program. They've done a lot of work. Cal Poly, where I teach, is just up the road, about 10 miles away. So there's a lot of interaction there. And I think uh, one of the things that's maybe a little different for them is that there is that focus on this is sort of the last, one of the last remaining estuaries. It's uh, got wonderful things, the steelhead trout. Um, they're actually coming back. Eelgrass, you'll recognize. Some of the terrestrial creatures, this guy I spent a lot of time with. This is Helminglipta wakariana, or the Moro shoulderband dune snail, uh, which is a federally protected species, endangered. And this is what kept the sewer at bay for about four years as we were going through a biological opinion work. It was the citizens of Los Osos that added another 30 years to that delay um, for the sewer. This is a little butterfly, more blue butterfly, that Sherry worked on when she was a student at Stanford. Um, and that's out there. The, uh, this estuary will continue to get a lot of work and I'll um, certainly forward to anybody the website and there's a great video about the history of putting that together. And I just go on at some length because this is where I'd spent so much time um, doing this work. Another program is called GLOBE, the Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment. It was started on Earth Day in 1995. Vice President Al Gore initiated this um, or kicked it off. NASA, the Science Foundation, NOAA, the State Department are all involved in this. And this um, program has been really wonderful in putting together protocols and programs for people. We have the start of a packet, information packet for uh, water watchers. And the protocols that are in here are largely from the GLOBE program. And uh, they are a wonderful group. Um, get kids involved, get citizens involved in things. And one of the nice things about this is, again, starting to get very uniform procedures for all these different groups. Because if every group reinvents the process, then you get variations that are difficult to push through. They are successful. Um, the number of total measurements, 155 trillion, um, no, wait, <laughs> million, 120, sorry, I'll, I'll end that little theme of humor. Um, Bud Burst is another, uh, again, part of this phenology program, um, having people watch and document when things start to uh, open up in the spring. The National Phenology, and that's what that's part of, the National Phenology Network. And I, again, I, I'm stressing these because it's, we have worked for a long time trying to bootstrap these operations, but in the, again, in the last five, 10 years, a lot of these national organizations have caught up and passed us, and now we need to attach ourselves to these things so that our, our information is more easily um, entered and accessible. Uh, Public Lab, another uh, sort of community outreach program. Um, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is an example of this. And their motto, so many birds, so little time. Actually, I put that in that there last night for the benefit of you. Um, but uh, Chris, you turned very old, um, 60 recently. And he had this sign on his shirt, so. Science Star, another one. Um, citizen Science is an organization that is 
trying to put all of these different organizations together. As a longtime member of um, charitable organizations and outreach organizations and things, I know that a common problem is this bootstrapping operation. Everybody's trying to do the same thing and reinventing stuff. So there are, and the 300 committee I know has encountered this and they have started to work with these larger trust organizations that um, have the same procedures and things. So that's part of what we're going to um, want to be working with in the future. All right. What are we after? Observations from people. We want people to go out and look at things, give us information, see how the world is behaving. What do we get also as part of this? And this is a really important notion here. I think when somebody goes and encounters the pond, takes the temperature, looks at the cloud cover, they start to develop an affection for that water body. And I, I'm preaching to the choir I know here, but for a lot of folks who haven't done this sort of stuff, maybe since they were a kid, um, this starts to reinvigorate that connection to nature that's important. The, one of the reasons Yosemite, which is a very overcrowded tourist spot in California, will always be open to the public is because oftentimes that's the only place that somebody gets to visit. When they make that connection in their head, then they become a supporter of nature. And when a threat comes along, either a physical threat or a political threat to something that's important to us, a resource, these past interactions are important. And then we have kids who um, are spending too much time inside. So it's important that we get them outside. There's something called nature deficit disorder. It's a little controversial. It's not exactly on the, Martha, I forget the list of dis mental disorders, but it hasn't made that list yet. Um, but the idea is to, to this should be multi-generational, get people outside and doing stuff. Uh, a study was done of um, 1,600 organizations looking at the levels of success and some issues with those. And this is what they've sort of cataloged as the values of this work. Improved communication between government and local stakeholders. These are values of science to the whole community. Increased knowledge and changed attitudes. Better adherence to environmental regulation by community members. That's a nice thing. And empowerment of local stakeholders. So this is what doing this kind of work also adds for our community. For individuals, a gain in knowledge, changes in their attitudes about things. Um, we all, uh, most of us, were here when Lady Bird Johnson started the Keep America Beautiful campaign. Before that time, you littered and you didn't think about it. After that, you could, I can't drop something out of my hand. It's physically impossible. Um, if somebody's looking. And so, <laughs> a, it's nice when somebody fresh gains access to the decision making process. Um, I've been at a million city meetings and I'm one of the people that the leaders are tired of hearing from. But when somebody new experiences this stuff, you can see them stand up and talk and they're usually nervous but they're enthralled with what's going on and that's something we get out of this. So that of course adds to this effectiveness in civic participation and you're probably wondering about the cute photos. Well of course this is what we need to have working for us um, because as we all pass along that, which is a euphemism, of course. Um, we want to make sure that this generation behind us, which is spending a little too much time looking at videos and playing electronics, uh, gets out there in the world and starts to understand the things the way we did when we were kids. So, and then, what are we talking about for us? The Water Watchers, this is a program that's been around for a while and it, um, we want to reinvigorate it, we want or, or invigorate it some more. This is from our website, and I won't read all of that, but this is what a water watcher will want to do, and this actually applies to the entire group of water stewards. This, these, this is a mission statement, if you will. 
And I think this is a good sense of who we are and why we are. Um, as I mentioned, thanks to the Woods Hole Foundation, we put together a information kit and we're going to be making these available to folks who sign up for this and it has um, the protocols it even has um, field guides and stuff to birds and whatnot whatever is necessary I bought a few dozen field guides to birds last year and I gave Sherry one just to show her how smart I was and she wrote me an email and said you got the West Coast birds <laughs> And I did, and, <laughs> and I explained to her, I said, well, l l let, me, let me just say something. That with climate change, we're gonna see a lot of <laughs> variation in species. And I'm from the West, and this, those words just mean almost the same to me. And I told my wife the story, and what did she say? You're stupid. She said, <laughs> said Chris, you're just stupid. So anyway, we got that fixed, but we're going to have this good stuff in here, and it'll be fun. There's, uh, I'll also mention that so much of this stuff now is available online, and a lot of the uh, um, monitoring and work that we want to do, there are apps that you'll have on your cell phone that you can take out into the field with you uh, to do this work. Um, I have a sign-up sheet. We have a sign-up sheet in the back. If you're interested in anything, any level of participation, or just finding out more about the Water Watchers program, which is part of the Water Stewards program, and there's an email address, very short, falmouthwaterwatchers at gmail.com. That'll come to me. And so uh, shoot me an email if you want to get any more information about this. Um, and there you go. Now, I was looking up stuff online for pictures of Falmouth waters and stuff, and I came across this. This is the summer of 1942, which was a movie, but it had a very different theme. Um, this was a, Washburn Island was a training ground for ambigu uh, ambiguous, um, amphibious, <laughs> amphibious landings. Um, some of these folks probably even in these photos uh, landed on Normandy Beach. That's, that was uh, how crucial these activities were. This is Camp Edwards facility for this kind of training. And just this photo here um, shows you how important the training and the rigors of this are because they're pulling an artillery piece off with a Jeep and the Jeep just bogged down in the sand. And so that's the kind of learning you want to do before you get to a Normandy. Um, and I don't mean to make light of that, but that's a, that was an incredible value in it. And I thought about this picture. Um, I have similar pictures from my hometown on the West Coast before folks headed off to the Pacific War. Not only is our coastline and our landform changing, um, and changing rapidly, what we do with it will change. And we don't know what's going to come up in the future. The more we know about it, the more we're aware of things, the better decisions we can make, especially when we have to make decisions on the spot, as was the case here. But I'll leave you with that, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to entertain them. Yes? Oh, thank you. Sorry. The question was, uh, where is the Morro Bay estuary on the west coast? Morro Bay is near San Luis Obispo, and it is almost halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco, north of Santa Barbara, south of Monterey. So it's a very lightly developed part of California. Um, very wonderful place. Yeah. Any thought, thoughts or questions? Okay. Good. Well, thank you all very much. Great to see you.